Hello, uh, this is Jeremiah Gibson with the New England Association of Family and Systemic Therapy. Uh, I'm so excited to be joined this morning by Jennifer Eaton. Uh, Jen is the Director of Dialectical Behavioral Therapy uh, as training and consultation, right? At yes. the Bridge Institute in Worcester. Right. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, there's a lot of really neat things going on in central Massachusetts. A lot of what we uh, do is events that are in Boston or events that are in Western Mass, but there's some really neat things going on in the Worcester area. And I'm curious, Jen, if you could talk a few minutes about what's going on at the Bridge Training Institute. Um, so, in fact, um, one thing that we started doing and we're going to do again next year is a specialized training in using DBT with families and particularly adolescents um, mm -hmm. and um, certainly DBT uh, for children are, is becoming a increased specialty uh, out there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually uh, one thing we just kicked off was a very small experiential training and chain analysis. Mm -hmm. And next, it's a two part series and the second part series is going to focus on using DBT within the family system, within mm -hmm. uh, couples. It's gonna be very experiential. And uh, we have a couple, we have a, uh, our group is very diverse, but we have a couples therapist, which I'm thrilled about. Yeah. And some family uh, clinicians who work with families and are like, great, how do I do DBT with families? So those are some highlights. Uh, we always have a full comprehensive series on DBT. And the individual therapy work is really focused on individual therapy, not family. So having the family, uh, the specialized training for families really brings it alive because that's essential when working with minors or obviously yeah. families. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's a good point. When we think of DBT, I think that we tend to think of it primarily as an individual-based uh, model, a skill-building process for individuals, sometimes with groups as well. Uh, I'm curious, what are some of the ways that you use DBT to uh, inform and enhance work with families? Um, okay, so with families, um, uh, especially when I work with adolescents, something I do is absolutely get the parents on board to understand the theory of DBT so it makes sense to them understand obviously the approach of the treatment and the goal is to increase people's skills so they're more effective with life family at school at work and so forth um, a lot of the families eat the skills up and sometimes the parents like more than teenagers because they are thrilled to have them right uh, and that's partly because teenagers are teenagers uh, and um, there's also a lot of focus on bringing DBT to families. So there's an extension called, uh, it's kind of spin off of DBT family connections for uh, individuals who are supporters of individuals in DBT. So for example, parents or spouses, um, yeah. and like, let's give you new skills to help build your relationship with those who may or may not be in DBT, but could you benefit from DBT? So it's very emotionally sensitive, DBT really targets emotionally sensitive people. And if you have a family members who really, like they don't get it, they don't understand the person's internal process, it can really disconnect families. And by giving families new skills to interact, because you know, this kid, for example, is different. Or yeah. I, I even had a, when I was at the training, a girlfriend was there to improve her relationship with her boyfriend. So obviously this is an important relationship. Absolutely. You know, improving uh, the you know one person in a family or couple, you know the parents in a family shifts the entire family beyond even the quote unquote identified patient of in DBT. Right. Or something. right. A lot of focus on families and some individuals also um, break up and do multifamily groups. So it's like let's teach everyone the skills. Uh, and let's have parents have their own coach. So something in DBT that's unique to a lot of treatment is being able to call your clinician in between sessions and say, please help me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to do right now. What can I do to make this you know, moment more effective? So they're mm -hmm. essentially calling for new skills. Mm -hmm. And parents are desperate for this. If their kid's in treatment, they need it. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly if couples are in treatment, boy, one person getting some more effective skills can change a conflict completely, make it an effective conflict and not a conflict that 
go south, for example. So, um, you know, so that's, uh, you know, parents often, I've gotten a number of calls with parents saying, hey, can I, can you be my skills coach? So mm -hmm. that's on a contact, like how do I approach this thing that's happening to my kid effectively? Um, yeah. You know, different, a lot of different dynamics. Um, and of course, family therapy is part of DBT if you have a minor in DBT. Sure. So, yeah, what are some of the commonalities that you notice between DBT and, and family systems work? Uh, so, relationships obviously uh, are a big part of DBT. If you don't right. have an effective relationship, you're not going to uh, make any change. I think that's the same in family systems. Yeah. Uh, one of the things um, I'd like to clarify I'm not an expert in family family therapy, and I work with a lot of families. So I think that's important. Um, but my understanding is, of you know, a lot of family systems or different family uh, theories is, it's the complexity of working with two or three individuals or five individuals. I have a one sure. client who has three siblings. And um, one thing that often happens, say if you have uh, argument between parents or mm -hmm. uh, disconnect between parents with their, with their child um, yeah. or children, um, but often like let's keep it simple and say one child, two parents, um, there's a lot of tension between different parties. Um, and something that's similar with DBT is they look at dialectics within relationships. So. For example, if you and I have a conflict um, or we disagree with something or have different values about a situation, we polarize. So I use the example of government. We often get very polarizing in the government. Um, so but families do that. We get really yeah. stuck in our own position and can't move back to the middle. And I say we because I have a family. So if we get stuck on you know one side or in the and our partner or a family member um, is stuck on the other side, yeah. uh, that creates conflict. And dialectics is, you know, certainly bringing ourselves to a new synthesis of understanding each other and saying, okay, what's the new way of thinking that brings both of us together? And mm -hmm. Um, you know, so that can be really helpful uh, because it breaks the, um, you know, the polarized uh, experience. The yeah. other in DBT that I think really has a big uh, focus is some of the skills. Um, one of the skills that um, I think is essential for every family is to really observe your family member. Be mindful of them as a whole person, not the conversation. And just by doing that, you can create a major change and sure. taking more time to validate. Uh, certainly, a lot of people think of DBT as very change focused and a lot of, because you know, it's behavior therapy, it's individualized and that's yeah. what we do. We change skills, we build skills. There's this piece of really on the other side of DBT that's often um, kind of makes what makes DBT unique is the validation is spending a lot of time saying, okay, I see your perspective now. Mm -hmm my perspective and what's our new perspective together and so that's validation and those are all key elements sure. of um, family systems and yeah and thinking about the process by which uh, yeah. two people then um, make agreements in new ways yes um, one of the things that I'm thinking about is this idea of when someone develops new skills that uh, the system that the system changes and, and, and sometimes that's definitely true Sometimes that's also not true. <laughs> Sometimes a person can develop new skills and the system, uh, which has a goal of, of maintaining homeostasis, will do whatever they can to pull that person back into uh, whatever the familiar role is. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess I'm curious how DBT uh, and family therapy, how DBT would address that process. Yes, you change one person and it can change a family. It can also create so much tension in the family that, yeah. you know, uh, and this is interesting. Sometimes uh, in my experience, the teenager gets more skillful and then the complaint is, but my mom or mm -hmm, and my right. dad, you know, they are not changing or the parents work really hard to learn new skills and then their child still struggles. And then it's like, right. well, hey, we're doing all this hard work. Why aren't we seeing all the changes we're looking for? So absolutely, yeah. uh, it can go in either direction or someplace in the middle. Uh, so in family therapy, it's really bringing up the dialectics of those two pieces 
and trying to help people synthesize and come to the middle. Um, and with family therapy, it's certainly trying to change everyone's skills um, to be, you know, more effective interacting with each other, to have improvement in understanding uh, even the teenagers I work with, because we tend to be really self focus as teenagers yeah, yeah. Uh, it's amazing watching them start to really say well i don't think my mom meant that that sure. way and stuff like that so part of it's um you know really kind of bringing the skills alive in session so family um a lot of family therapies really focus on the process you know of relationships yeah. and the process processing a conflict right. uh and see anytime you can bring a new skill to the moment you've just improved the moment. So you can bring the skills within the family therapy saying, okay, let's, let's practice that again using this skill, sure. You're bringing the skills alive in the session, which will increase the likelihood that there might, um, you know, they, the family might rebalance outside of it because everyone's practicing the skills and as opposed to the one person changing skills and the others are not. Right, right. So, so doing uh, DBT as an experiential process then increases the likelihood that multiple family members will be experiencing the same process and can develop um, can develop new ways of interacting together, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to to some of the challenges of doing DBT in an individual context, and then hoping that hoping hoping for the best when you reinsert that individual back. Right. Sorry. Sorry. I, sorry. Again. sorry. Uh, I just totally cut you off. Sorry. Um, okay. But by teaching one person, it's the hope of geez, maybe you'll affect the family in a positive way. And actually sure. that often doesn't happen. It's, you know, you can be as effective as possible. The family uh, doesn't respond in the way you're hoping for. Mm -hmm. Not helpful. Yeah. Uh, they, and often the complaint is, well, I did everything and nothing changed. I'm like, well, that's because you're not working with just you being skillful. It, sure. It's the whole family being skillful. So that is not actually uncommon. Actually, I would say it's pretty common. And that's where mm -hmm. bringing family members into individual therapy or yeah. um, into family therapy and having distinct family therapy um, right. with the skills in mind to teach everyone, to bring everyone to practice new skills, to improve communication, mm -hmm. improve emotion regulation uh, within the family context. So um, yeah. have an outcome they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me back up a bit. I want to I continue this conversation we're having at some point, but uh, just give a little bit more information about this interview. Uh, you're doing a presentation called Communicating Effectively with Children and Families, yes. Key Strategies from Dialectical Behavior Therapy in October, and that's with the Bridge Training Institute. Yes. Is that a part of the, the longer series that you were talking about, or is that a separate? It's separate. It's actually a spinoff, although a lot of people who take the series come because they okay. work with families or they work with couples, uh, they work with teenagers and want to do that. Um, so both, um, sometimes it's a lot of review for those who are well-versed in DBT and sure. it's great new knowledge for someone who isn't yeah. um, well-versed in DBT. And both are true. Uh, you can be a great individual therapist and do DBT really well and then get really lost in how to bring it into the family sessions. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and a lot of family therapists who come to that training only leave with a boatload of skills and okay, I have a few new strategies I can bring into my sessions uh, and, you know, pending your family and pending, you know, how you're viewing your family, it could be a game changer. Sure. I know it was, it wasn't, it is for me with a number of families I work with. Yeah. Well, and the next question that I'm thinking about is on behalf of people that are new to DBT. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the theory that we work with, it definitely drives our practice. And the language that we use is really important too. Um, mm -hmm. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about kind of buzzwords that we use in family therapy that mean like 13 different things. Differentiation is, is one that, that comes to mind. Um, yeah. And in most of my family therapy trainings, I have to like explain what differentiation means. Um, mm -hmm. Dialectics, I presume, it kind of serves a similar function in the DBT world. And I guess I'm curious, yeah. when you've used the term dialectic, what specifically are you referring to? Uh, great question. I find if I do a DBT training or even use DBT as an acronym or people uh, were recommended dialectical behavior therapy, the first question is, what is that? Right. Uh, it's, uh, you know, so 
certainly educating on that is important. So talking, of, you know, my the most simple explanation I give, and this is after uh, spending a number of weeks with my consultation team when I first learned DBT on, okay, what is this? How can I really understand it? I think it was a little more concrete in those days, um, but it's two opposing truths are both true. Uh, and this is, uh, and the goal is to synthesize the two new true truths to make a new truth. How's that for a lot of truths? So good. truth means someone's perspective, someone's view on something, someone's values. Uh, and this is huge. Isn't in families the parents right and the kids wrong? Uh, I know right. I, that was the case. And then that's the way that the structure gets established. Right. I'm right, you're wrong, do what I say, that type of stuff. And as uh, children become adults, of course, they think I'm right and you <laughs> parents are wrong. So as the child slash now adult becomes parents, now suddenly their parents are completely ineffective, even though, geez, you turned out okay. So the you know, the polarized two truths are there over and over again. And, you know, most family therapies, how do you synthesize these family members together to make a new family system that functions more effectively? Right. So, so yeah, explaining dialectics and really bring it alive using mm -hmm. language like, so that was your experience and that was your experience, um, you know, bringing, say, two people into, into the room yeah. and their experiences, um, bringing just the word and to bridge them can be really helpful because it's not one negates yeah. the other. It's like, well, hey, teenager, your truth's still valid. Sure, even, sure. You know, there's even a fact missing. Uh, and then so is the parents and how can mm -hmm. both stay alive? And that alone can change the dynamics. Yeah. Um, I love that transition, that language transition, moving buts to and. Oh, big one. This is true, and this is true. Um, it, it seems like there's a, there's a, um, it seems like there's an emotional processing that happens within the relationship when you use the word "and" that that allows for um, kind of different outcomes. Absolutely, I think it also brings the adolescent more present. I've worked with so many adolescents, and even mentioning doing a family meeting, they're like, "No, they just leave," you know, not. They leave sometimes family therapy sessions in the past feeling like, oh, all the adults ganged up on me. And right. even if that's not true, the adolescent still has that perception. So just um, because everyone else are adults and, and then it's right. them or one person, sometimes more kids, um, but especially when it's that one adolescent who has a stronger voice when they were kids, so differentiating more. Yeah. And, um, and you know, they felt ganged up on and even young adults. I'm like, well, let's bring your family in. Let's talk about how dialectics is a game changer and how it affects your family. And the family is, how do, you, how do you have the neutral person? Here's how I'm going to be neutral if I'm the individual therapist and becoming the family therapist. Sure. Uh, how do you keep their voice alive but also bringing the parent's voice into yeah. the room? Uh, and that can be really helpful. Well, yeah, you've, you've talked about validation. You've talked about keeping both voices alive. I'm curious, what are some other uh, kind of theoretical ideas from DBT that you teach uh, to family members and particularly parents in family therapy? Yeah. So certainly the B in DBT is behaviorism. So there is this piece that we're wired as humans to look for the problems. We look for dangers. Uh, that's why we're alive today. Mm -hmm. um, helping all of us rethink to notice the positive changes takes actually a lot more effort. Right. We can come through and say, and have a really effective um, conversation about something we disagree on. We're going to leave saying, wow, that felt good, but we're going to be on the lookout for the next bad fight we have. Cause that's what we do. We fight a lot. Um, so really helping them, highlight that with each other saying you know that was really helpful um you know i appreciate the fact we finished this conversation and we're able to both of us uh that can be really helpful if everyone's looking for the good in each other and reinforcing that the family's going to do more of that instead of going back uh to look for the danger signs um yeah. And so behaviorism is a big one mindfulness is huge too if we can bring more mindfulness whether to be more aware of ourselves and more aware of 
each other, then that's changing everything. You see a look on someone's face come, you're like, hey, what happened? Someone comes home from a bad day and we're just so focused on our own bad day. Mm -hmm. We don't stop and say, whoa, you okay? So those are little things that families become automatic. If you have things to do, you have to cook dinner, uh, try to get lunches ready for tomorrow and and so forth. not uh, a negative comment against say a family member like a parent but they're caught up in five ten tasks they might miss a moment to say hey she just asked nicely to talk to me i'm gonna engage they're thinking i don't want to burn dinner uh so it's really increasing mindfulness um to each other can be really helpful um mindfulness is often taught how can it improve ourselves uh, so, you know, it's like, we want to be in the present moment. We want to be, have full awareness without judgment. Great. And how do we use that with each other? And by doing that can be really effective. Right. Because mindfulness also slows down the process. Exactly. The last, um, a whole module in DBT is called interpersonal effectiveness. And it's bringing, um, you know, b- basically concrete skills and um, concepts to individuals on how do you communicate more effectively and uh, whether I've you know trained professional adults or yeah. trained you know individual um, adolescents or young adults in a skills training group mm-hmm. uh, using what we would say in, in uh, interpersonal effectiveness uh, dear man skill for example suddenly getting your needs met changes so mm-hmm. if you want to ask um, you know, to go out on a Friday night and it's kind of like, you know, your parents are leaning toward a no. To use dear man can really allow your voice to stay in the room. can also allow a parent to deliver um, a no more effectively. So it's bringing communication uh, structure. And if you have a high emotional family, having structure in your communication style can really help effectively deliver. So a parent would use dear man to say no instead of saying, ah, no. (laughs) <laughs> which the answer is the same. It's just the delivery can really allow the acceptance of the note to change. Right. Right. Two of the things that you'll be describing at the workshop in October are chain and solution analyses. Yes. Um, what are ways that you, uh, you, that you utilize these two processes? Uh, so a chain analysis is um, in, you know, kind of in a snapshot is a, careful analysis of one incident. So with a family, it's taking um, a careful analysis of, so let's just say on the theme of conflict, because usually that what gets families into a room, right? Into therapy. Uh, So you do a snapshot of here's the conflict. Mm -hmm. And in individual therapy, you're focused on, on certainly one person and helping them understand the problem that they're bringing to the table And then what are new skills to do so? In a family session, you're bringing everyone's quote unquote chain into the room. Mm -hmm. So a chain is looking at what set the event off, whatever the event is. Um, What are your thoughts, feelings, you know, what changes inside your body in response? So if we have a thought, um, oh, my parents paying attention to me, um, we have a really nice chain analysis from a child. They think they're getting, especially if it's, you know, positive attention, or even just any attention if they often feel not attended to. Uh, So that's, so how does that come in with the mom's chain and the dad's chain or, you know, siblings chain and interweaving that can increase understanding of each other. Yeah. And, you know, just by kind of really having that strong sense of, Oh, that's what you were thinking. No wonder you acted that way. Um, So, I mean, I've seen doing, for example, with a mom and daughter, um, the daughter was my client, just bringing the mom in and doing one session Mm -hmm. and doing what we call a double chain. So doing a chain of both, but interweaving them together. Oh my gosh. They were like, that's what you thought? I had no idea. And suddenly Mm -hmm. there was like, boom, the validation. And towards the other position too. Right. And then also, how do you, instead of uh, in individual therapy, it's what's the solutions you personally can do to be more effective, um, to reduce whatever that behavior is. Um, so in a family, it must just keep using conflict. A solution analysis with a family and doing, bringing those chains of individuals' internal experience 
into the external um, experience or the conflict that, you know, the components every family member was part of, mm -hmm. and then our internal, com you know, components, someone only knows by telling them. Um, right. But you can have a, we start to really understand each other's looks. We know what that means. Oh, I know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but often there's a surprise by doing a chain to say, wait, that's what you thought? So a solution analysis says, let's create a, um, a variety, of, you know, basically a solution for the whole family to do something different. Mm -hmm. So um, even as simple as, you know, actively listen while you're, so that would be a validation strategy, actively listen while the person talks and don't interrupt. Like yeah. on one hand, so simple, and I've already interrupted you once right in the beginning of this interview. Uh, so it's so easy to do. And with family members, my gosh, the one thing we love as individuals to do is make our point. So we want to make it now. Uh, and, you know, so the solution comes to a plan for all family members to agree to. So next time you have a conflict, let's try doing, you know, these things instead and see how yeah. it goes. And then you might even bring it alive in the room. Let's practice the skills before you go. Let's do that conflict again. What could you yeah. say to me? What could yeah. you say to me? and they leave with a plan as a family one of the things we talk about in family therapy is making the implicit explicit mm -hmm. and, and one of the common ways that implicit rules are established in a family is narratives that we tell ourselves about nonverbals. Mm -hmm. and it seems that the chain analysis and the solution analysis is a way to make kind of implicit rules more explicit and Absolutely. also more collaborative uh, because the family then is agreeing to these particular types of processes um, around around how communication is going to work, for instance. And it can be really helpful because, you know, if you're doing individual work in DBT, the common complaint is, well, I tried it, it didn't work. Um, right. Or I did it, but mom didn't do it. And in family uh, therapy, it would be, okay, how to go? And everyone has a role. And how right. do you, without judgment, Mm -hmm. evaluate everyone's role including let's say a parent came home with high stress from work and they did not validate their kid sure kids love to point that out um like right. hey mom, you didn't validate me uh and true uh not on purpose because you're being human and so how do you bring that alive and help the family with collaboration and without judgment mm -hmm. you know, figure that out and yeah. figure out how to manage a conversation either when that is absent or to, you know, just increase a, you know, heighten awareness of yourself saying, whoa, yeah, I didn't. It explains where we ended up and so forth. Right, right. I'm curious how you adapt DBT skills to meet the developmental needs and capacities of children. Great question. That uh, is a question that comes up in most of my trainings uh, that I do with professionals. Uh, so certainly DBT started with, you know, for, it's an adult treatment, like adult, a lot of adult treatments, they say, hmm, this might work with adolescents. So they trickle it down to adolescents, make some adaptations. Mm -hmm. And then it's, hey, gosh, if we got to them even younger, wouldn't it be great if maybe they wouldn't end up as an, in a, as a crisis in adolescence, maybe the family could establish being more skillful early on. So with, in, with, Children, um, it's actually not that different. You might emphasize certain pieces, um, you know, more and take out certain pieces. So, for example, in interpersonal effectiveness is building, um, is maintaining your own, you know, self-respect. So it might be sticking with your own values. Well, little kids, we want them to listen to their parents um, and conform on some level to learning what the parents are teaching them. Um, so you might not focus so much on how to maintain self-respect within the family. Uh, and at the same time, that's a really important skill to develop as we age. Uh, so a lot of it to me is just a different way of teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, DBT has tons of acronyms. We love to make things more complex than they need to be. Um, it's just how the package is. When we're, you're well-versed, it just rolls off your tongue. And when you're new, you're like, why do you have to say to your man? Why are there seven mindfulness skills? And it's not mindfulness is mindfulness. Why do you break it down? With little kids, you're just teaching it maybe a little more concretely, maybe teach it more like, you know, slow it down because they need to spend more time with the concept. Uh, 
And of course, in um, family therapy, a lot more focus when you have a younger child is on how can the parents parent more effectively and kids skills, but more importantly, you want the parents to help teach the skills to the children. So that's a different focus, whereas adolescents are a little more capable of learning on their own and usually prefer to learn without their parents uh, Yeah, and, and so forth. So I'm curious how you coach parents to be teachers for their children of the DBT skills. What does that process look like? Just like us, we need to learn the skills first and apply them ourselves. And then it's how do we turn ourselves into teachers and then coaches, how do we turn parents? So um, part of it is, well, give them the skills on how to teach their kids. Mm -hmm. Give them skills, uh, some of the things you might specifically do in what any therapy you're doing is how about you do it with your child so mm-hmm. bring up the skill component saying hey let's practice mindfulness right now together you know i'm seeing there's a lot of emotion growing aka your child starting to get really escalated mm-hmm. so let's do mindfulness together so it's a lot more skills together um as a way to help bring the child uh to practice um uh, yeah. and at the same time uh it's really amazing how quickly children start using the skills on their own Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh so that's true too but usually with with little kids like say a seven-year-old it's parents need to do with not instruct and certainly when you're older kid you don't want to hear your parents instructions sure Uh, sure. yourself and apply yourself and that's where skills coaching can be so helpful especially for adolescents and parents is but, but really for adolescents, if you think, I don't want to hear from my mom how to do this, but I'll call this other adult, call my therapist. Right. Um, certainly an advantage for the therapist. Um, we're not the mom or the dad. Yeah. I think the word with is really important. And I'm thinking about this, not just from the perspective of the parent child, but also from the perspective of the therapist in the family. Absolutely. I'm curious how you talk with therapists about the role and the stance of the therapist in DBT. Uh, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Part of it is we will play the skills. In family therapy, if we're trying to help, say, the family be more skillful, you have to join with the fam- all members of the family. So how do you how do you connect with each individual while also connecting with the whole family? Uh, and so it's you know maybe something I would do as a DBT family therapist is to highlight when I'm not skillful and then correct myself. So saying, wow, that was a judgmental comment. Let me try that again. And I restate it um, so they can see that's simply what you can do. And how can we all do this together? Um, so I'm noticing a lot of judgment in the room. Let's, let's step back, re- you know, kind of do a quick quickie on how do we do that conversation differently? How would you say um, whatever that judgmental comment you might repeat? in you know in a new way that's without judgment how would you do it mom and so you're bringing everyone in the room to uh do that together yeah i like that focus on Mm self-awareness and self-awareness of the therapeutic process as well Uh, i'm curious how you address that address self-awareness uh for therapists when you do training when you do supervision um so one thing that's really common and probably i don't know how often as often as done in family therapy, because I've never done in family therapy. Uh, in DBT, we often record a sessions. Mm-hmm. And oh my, if you ever did that, and even in graduate school, you realize how quickly right. what your actions are, you know, in, you know saying to um, the family, so nonverbals. Um, you know, so do you lean in more when the teenager's talking, but not the parents? Mm-hmm. Um, no. For me, I'm, you know, have a trouble hearing sometimes. I lean in with soft talkers and then to stop and say, wait, how am I communicating to the whole therapy, you know, the whole family? Yeah. Something that's effective for me to hear better. Uh, and I'm doing that. But what is, what's that effect? So if I watch recordings of myself, I say, oh, look at that. Every time the teenager talks, I lean in. Mm -hmm. Um, to try to really connect with that teenager because I feel less connected with that teenager. And is there um, a nonverbal message getting picked up by the parents? Uh, Of course, we don't know. And of course we can, but but just like doing that, you learn a lot. 
Uh, uh, we can also ask as well. We can also uh, observe with the family. Hey, this is something that I noticed, mom, dad. I'm curious if you notice this as well, or I'm curious what what happens for you uh, when when I, when I lean in, and then you kind of cycle it back into the family discourse. I know for me as a therapist, um, I have become such a better therapist using mindfulness. My uh, being, you know, instead of having my mind like thinking it's Friday, what am I doing later? And it's amazing how, as I started doing mindfulness more and more, I, I caught myself like, wow, I just started thinking of dinner. Of course, I'm kind of hungry. How do I bring myself back to this moment? Um, but I've now found myself so in tune with the moment, I can actually, I need to be more mindful of the time uh, yeah. as opposed to like, I have no idea. I didn't think about Friday dinner once. I was so focused. So I find um, by using my skills, particularly mindfulness, I have become so aware of my own self in there and so aware of how I talk. So just, you know, I've had people say, my gosh, and just flows out of your mouth when you talk. You just, you said and like seven times. And of course, I don't really even notice anymore. It's my habit now. Right. Uh, so being more mindful of those moments, if I was trying to correct my language to really, you know, stay united with everyone in the room and use dialectical language, I'm going to be very aware of that. Um, and over time, it might become more habit. But uh, us using new skills takes a lot of mindfulness and, and yeah. awareness in that regard. Um, I hope I answered that question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that that's important uh, for us as therapists to remember that, you know, we're joining the system when yes. we're working with a family and um, we can often, um, a family will look to us for cues and we can also mirror what's going on uh, with, with sometimes without even recognizing it. So I think that makes a lot of sense for uh, using mindfulness as a way of of helping therapists become more aware of their uh, of, of their own actions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you mentioned that part of the year long train it's a year long training, correct? Uh, yes. Um, so a lot of DBT trainings are very condensed because you're traveling to do it. Right. Uh, so if you're going to Seattle to do a training uh, right. near Martha Linehan's uh, school uh, where she works, you really want to condense it into a week. Uh, and then, mm -hmm. you know, my, my training, I went and did probably most of graduate school level homework. So we had intense homework to do. And then we came back for another week and I found my learning was challenged. So, you know, by Thursday, I was like, this is really hard to stay focused. Of course yeah. now I'm far more effective at it. Um, than when I first learned UBT fresh, fresh out of school. Mm -hmm. So, I broke it up into um, basically a once a month training day with the expectation that you go practice, go practice your mindfulness in session, go teach mindfulness to your, uh, you know, individuals. Hey, teach it to your kids, Te mm -hmm. just teach it, practice it, and then come back with more questions. Mm -hmm. um, come back with, okay, now you used it. Now you have a place to really talk about it. Whereas before you're already moving into the next, you know, tomorrow, um, learning something new, you don't even have time to like even grasp the concept. So yeah. I, um, so it was, I'd say an eight-ish month process. You're doing one, one Friday a month with the goal to master it and to practice. And uh, so that was just my way of making learning me. Yeah. Right. I would find more effective learning, which means I get a lot of, you know, I, so most of the people who attend, of course, then are local therapists from mm -hmm. Connecticut, Vermont, and Massachusetts, although, you know, sometimes someone might fly in. Uh, yeah. You mentioned in that training process that there's also conversations about couples therapy. Um, yes. And a lot of the members that we have do, do couples therapy as well as family therapy. I'm curious what you notice are the differences between teaching dbt skills in a parent-child dynamic and yes. in a partner partner dynamic absolutely and to clarify the comprehensive series doesn't have as much focus on the family system or couples so i you okay. know so people don't get misled um you know the skills are the skills everyone ought to learn them but you know families in you know in versus like a marital uh, relationship or boyfriend, girlfriend, or, you know, spouses, uh, partners, whatever um, the makeup is. So two people versus, um, you know, two people, I guess, um, three people, whatever the numbers are and their, their children. Uh, 
it's certainly with two people, you're, um, you know, walking through a chain is far easier. You have two chains in the room, not three. Um, and even when I teach like the double chain originally in, you know, in that training and in uh, my experiential chain analysis training I'm doing next month, um, it's, I really focus on doing it with two people. It's almost like to bring in two chains, getting that, like that down and how to interact, you know, inter and, and, you know, kind of bring them together and separate them at the same time. I actually think a family therapist will be far more effective at doing it with multiple people mm -hmm. far sooner than someone who might have a concentration in individual therapy. So um, with couples, it's, there's not as many differences as one would think because you're bringing the skills to two people. You're, in fact, if you might see change more quickly because there's less people involved. So if you have a um, something I recently did with a young adult um, who's primarily my individual client, um, but her, her um, boyfriend is actively involved in her treatment is, how do we create a new plan for you and your boyfriend to communicate together? How can he support you? Uh, that's you know a different angle um, than bringing parents in with a child or something like that. Or um, so I don't see as many differences, except certainly it'd be far more personal on the intimacy between two people, yeah. um, as opposed to more of the parent-child focus of family systems um, or the larger family systems. Gotcha. Um, so the family system would be focusing more on like family structure. Uh, mm -hmm. The couple dynamic would uh, figure out how to incorporate intimacy, connect. Right, exactly. More focus on the two of them versus mm -hmm. two of them and three children or something. Right, right, right. Um, any of us is interested in connecting with new therapists. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm curious what feedback you would give to therapists who are new in the field. Uh, in regards to DBT? In regards to DBT or just in regards to being a therapist? Oh, absolutely. I love that question because um, one of my favorites is teaching. Uh, I love teaching new people. Uh, I love supervising and taking a new therapist and helping them be effective. Probably because I felt very lost and ineffective when I first got out of school. Uh, so advice on DBT um, is it can really bring a lot of skills. Um, if you're feeling lost and confused as I was, uh, I found DBT was a game changer is it gave me a lot of more structure in my sessions uh, and it gave me a lot of tools. So I had a lot of tools fast. Um, a lot of therapy is, has a concept uh, with less tools. So it's more of a processing. And right. I know for me, I needed really concrete skills I can bring to the table mm -hmm. and concrete skills I can use. That certainly was a game changer for me as a therapist. For new therapists, um, I would say, um, by building your own skills, increasing your self-awareness right away, and being aware of your, uh, I hate to use the word deficits, but being aware of your needs sooner can, uh, you know, in a more insightful, concrete, um, you know, uh, perspective, instead of mine where I was totally lost and confused everywhere, uh, I think it helps you grow more quickly. Yeah. Uh, and you're, you know, being more mindful of, from the beginning of your career can really help uh, elevate your learning faster than say myself. I would say I was not so mindful coming out of graduate school. Right. Uh, so, you know, DBT can bring structure to a new therapist, uh, certainly bringing mindfulness to be more self-aware of yourself as a therapist. How can you create change can be really helpful. And so it, interestingly, as someone evolves in the, their career, there's a lot of blending of different therapies. You can you can almost watch different therapies and say, wow, that looks like that therapy. That looks like that therapy model. Right. In the beginning, you're far more differentiated because you're trying really hard to master one therapy. So new people, learn one thing at a time. And yeah. with not learning everything. Mm -hmm. In fact, having a specialty is far more effective than trying to know everything. Right. It, it'll make you good at something. You can market yourself as, I'm a DBT expert, instead right. of, I do DBT, CBT, ACT, motivational interviewing, family systems, and, and your list gets so long, and that might be true, but in the beginning, yeah. pick one and master it. 
-hmm. and you can add more tools to your tool belt as you grow. Yeah. Uh, that would be, I think my biggest, um, point is yeah. build one master one, and then you can really find you'll master other things more quickly. Yeah. I think that's really good feedback. Um, thank you so much, Jen, for joining me today. Again, uh, Jen will be speaking at the, uh, the Bridge Training Institute in Worcester in October, communicating effectively with children and families, key strategies from dialectical behavioral therapy. Uh, and where can folks find out more information about that conference? If you go to our website, uh, wait for it, www.thebridgetraininginstitute, all one word, uh, spell it out, um, dot org, and okay. it lists all the trainings. I'm not 100% sure, unfortunately, I should have checked if all the trainings for next year are up yet. Um, okay. But keep your eyes open. Um, I'm also hoping to do some more specialized training that bring more experiential work to the table. So a lot of the yeah. trainings that are listed and that I've done in the past are very um, didactic. You know, you got to yeah. get a lot of people in the room uh, to make, uh, you know, ends meet, so to speak. Uh, and so, you know, keep your eyes peeled for uh, spinoffs that are more experiential and more specialized. Um, that might cover, the, you know, a lot of the same concepts. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Take care.